Hey, as we begin, let me ask you, what's your favorite Christmas memory? Maybe it's presents on Christmas morning. Maybe it's, uh, it's going to grandma's house, and all of the things that happen there. Maybe you're one of those families that has like matching PJs for the kids. I don't know. Well, for me, my favorite memories are two small things that you might find kind of odd. One of my favorite memories about Christmas is a tradition, tradition we do almost every year, and it's the vegetable tray. You're thinking, Jay, Christmas is, Christmas is for candy. I know, but for every year at Christmas, we always have a nice big vegetable tray that we do. We make the vegetables. We have the dip. We put it out on the table uh, while we're opening presents, and we all kind of get our share of it. Uh, another favorite Christmas uh, tradition of ours, and one of my favorite memories, is the Christmas stocking. They always hang above the fireplace, and we open all the presents, and sometimes we forget to do the stocking. Sometimes we remember, and it's always kind of a big thing. And our stockings are simple. It's always a thing full of uh, candy, maybe a few little things in there. And when I was growing up, it always included a Pez dispenser. Every year was a different Pez dispenser in our stocking. And so we had a good time opening stockings every year. Well, you know, Christmas is usually about largeness. It's about big stuff, big trees, big presents, all these big things. But, you know, a lot of times it's the small things that we remember. It's the tiny things that, uh, that kind of catch in there and we think about years later. You know, this year, Christmas is going to be a little bit different for many of us. This year, Christmas is going to be maybe just a few of us at home. Maybe Christmas this year won't have all the largeness that it has. Maybe events are scaled back. I know in our area, events have been scaled back a little bit. And, you know, it's just going to be different. Some of us haven't uh, seen our loved ones or our family or our friends really uh, a lot since uh, some way, maybe back in April, since before Easter. And we're getting ready to celebrate Christmas. And again, things are totally different. But this year, I want us to remember, as we begin studying our lessons today in the book of Luke, I want us to remember that uh, Christmas might be about the large things. It's the small things that we remember. And today, we're going to learn that God uses small things, things that are inconsequential to maybe the larger historical order, uh, things that maybe the rest of the world looks at and says, well, that's not very useful. God uses those small things to accomplish His big purposes. Look in your book, if you've got it, on page 13. Now, I want you to see that God involves humanity in the redemptive plan of his creation. Well, last week in our study in the book of Luke, we learned about a visit by the angel Gabriel to a man named Zechariah in the temple in the capital, Jerusalem. And today we're going to learn, we're going to pick up six months later, and we're going to learn about another visit by the same angel Gabriel to a young woman named Mary in off the beaten track part of, of Israel, a place that most people didn't go to and most people didn't think about. So let's pick up today and let's look at Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. So in this passage, we learn that Mary and Joseph are engaged to be married. Uh, now, being engaged in that day was a little bit different than being engaged in our day. Today, you know, somebody might want to get engaged. They're going to maybe find a nice place to go do it. They're going to buy a ring. They're going to go. They're going to propose. They might take some pictures, post them on uh, Instagram or Facebook, and then they're going to uh, tell the family or the family might already know, and then they're going to uh, tell the whole world. They're going to send out save the date cards. They're going to start uh, finding a venue. They're going to get a wedding dress. All these things are happening. They're taking place. But along the way, you know, there's always that chance. There's always the possibility that somebody's going to get cold feet. Somebody just might not show up at the altar on the day of. You never know. It's always a possibility. But in that day and age, in Joseph and Mary's day and age, this wasn't a possibility. It wasn't possible for one of them to just quickly back out of an engagement. You see, the engagement in the marriage process was two steps. First off, Mary and Joseph would engage in a, a contract. They would uh, sign the paperwork, they'd get it all done, and they would be engaged for one year, living separately apart, but engaged and betrothed in a special way. They were united, but they just weren't living together yet. And then finally the day would come and, and Mary and Joseph would have their big celebration. They would have their big feast. It would go on for days and days. And at the end of that, 
they would get together and they would consummate the marriage and they would uh, move into a house together and they would set up their own household and they'd progress forward from there. So you see, as Gabriel comes to Mary and he says to her, uh, I've got big news for you. And, and she's thinking I'm engaged and all these things. And she knows that, that throughout this process that she's engaged. She's not just maybe getting married. She is getting married. And the only way out of this is for her to get a divorce. And this is a big deal for them. We see Mary just wasn't engaged to a man named Joseph. She was engaged to a man named Joseph who was from the house of David. And this is important for our story, not just because of who he is and who she is, but because of where they come from. He comes from the lineage of the king. And so for us to understand both these things, her being uh, a virgin and, uh, and not yet married and her being uh, betrothed to Joseph of the line of David, I think we've got to go to the Old Testament to better understand that. Go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. It says, Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. Psalm 132, 11. The Lord swore an oath to David, a promise he will not abandon. I will set one of your descendants on your throne. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive, have a son, and you will name him Emmanuel. So we saw last week in our lesson on Zechariah, that God had been planning this whole thing for a long time. He had prophesied about John many years before. And now we see today that he's also prophesied about the child that Mary's going to have many, many years before as well. He said to David, I'm going to keep someone on your throne. I'm going to keep someone there forever. We see it again in the book of Psalms, God promising that someone's going to be on the throne of David. And now here we have Joseph and even Mary both kind of descending from that same line from David. And so, so we have here this idea that someone coming from David is going to be important, and that's going to be the child that Mary's going to have. But we also see way back in Isaiah that God prophesied that not only would the child be born, but it would be born of a virgin. And so I think it's important for us to remember that God's been planning this for a long time, and he had this idea, and he's finally working it out in fruition. But look with me at verses 28 and 29, and I want us to see how the angel greeted Mary. I want us to see her response. The word used here for greeting could also be a word uh, that is an exclamation by, by Gabriel. He didn't say greetings, Mary. He said rejoice, Mary. It's an exclamation. He's excited and she should be excited. And that's where he begins. But then he, he then says, uh, he calls her favored woman. This word for favored, it's tied to the word that links us back to grace. God and Gabriel being gracious with Mary. God is graciously allowing her to be part of his big plan. He's, he's giving her something she didn't deserve. Mary didn't put in an application to become the, the, the mother of Jesus. Mary didn't go to an, an audition to find out she would be a good mother of Jesus. No. God says, Mary, I'm graciously choosing you. I'm bestowing upon you the privilege of being part of my plan. I love what it says in our leader book. It says, her greatest qualification was not her own righteousness, but the fact that the Lord was with her. Why is it important to remember that a person's involvement in God's plan is based on grace rather than merit? And really even consider this in terms of modern uh, work in the church and mo the modern place that, of service in the church. Now, it's easy to understand why Mary is going to be wondering at this greeting from the angel. He's telling her to rejoice. He's telling her that she is a favored one. God is graciously involving her in the plan. And Mary's going, what is going on? She's wondering at this. What, what's happening? Well, look with me in Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 30, 33, and listen for all the details of the promised Messiah. Then the angel told her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, who will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Now Gabriel is about to drop some truth on Mary. He, uh, he First, though, he calms her down. He, then he starts making some really big proclamations. He first off, he says, Mary, you're going to have a child, and uh, you're going to do so as a virgin. 
And then he says, you're going to name that child Jesus. And that name Jesus is the same name as Joshua that we might know from the Old Testament. And, uh, and in this process, we learn that Jesus and Joshua mean God saves. In Matthew's account of the story of Gabriel visiting Joseph, uh, he adds on that he will save the people from their sins. And so Mary begins to hear these things from Gabriel, and Gabriel's dropping all this on her. But then he gives us three messianic truths about the coming child. First, he says the child is going to be great. If you remember back to our study about Zechariah, uh, Gabriel says, says very similar things about, about John. He says John is going to be great in the sight of the Lord. Well, he doesn't offer that caveat here. He just says Jesus is going to be great. There's not, there's not any caveat, no, no, no uh, tapping around, no dancing around it. He's going to be great. Then it says he's going to be the son of the Most High. If we remember back to our, our look in, uh, in earlier in, um, in Isaiah chapter 7, uh, he says that he's going to be Emmanuel. See, he's not just going to be the son of the Most High. He is going to be God with us. Jesus is going to be God on earth in flesh. Then he says that he is going to assume the throne of David. You see, David ruled over a small kingdom in the Middle East named Israel. But from David is going to come Jesus. And Jesus is going to rule over a throne that's going to last forever. And the kingdom is going to be widespread. Jesus' ministry is not just to Israel, but it is to the whole world. So in the commentary, Exalting Jesus in Luke, uh, the, the author points out another really fascinating tidbit. He says that Gabriel is giving Mary insight into the, two of the greatest theological truths of, of Christianity. First off, he's, in, he's introducing her to the idea of the incarnation, that Jesus is going to come from heaven to earth, be God in flesh. This is something that's unfathomable, that God chooses to do it. Second, Gabriel is introducing Mary to the idea of the Trinity. Now, she may not be catching on to it, but we see that the Holy Spirit is involved in the birth of Jesus. We see that the Father is involved in the birth of Jesus. And we see that it is Jesus himself that's going to come and live on earth and walk among man and women. And so Mary's getting this great theological truth that she's probably, she's just overwhelmed probably. But I want us to consider really what does this mean in light of the Old Testament? We're going to do a Bible skills activity and I'm going to give you some, some verses to look up and I want you to look those verses up and I want you to consider and answer the questions about Jesus' identity and about, about us and how this affects us personally. So maybe do this activity. Teachers, if you want to do something like this in your class, I encourage you to maybe divide your class into groups of twos or threes and give each group uh, a, a verse and then also uh, ask them to answer each question and then call them back together to report afterwards. It's important for us to connect this New Testament story, this New Testament truth to Old Testament prophecies uh, because it's important that we understand that God had a plan for humanity from the very beginning to solve our sin problem. But it's also important for us to connect these stories to us personally because you see in Genesis 3.15 when God really began this plan, we, uh, he was thinking about us. He was thinking about you and me. It wasn't just about Adam and Eve. It was about all of us. But it's also important for us to connect this back to Mary. Mary was paying a big part in this plan, and God chose her. God graciously allowed Mary to be part of his plan, just like he graciously allows you and me to be part of his plan today. Now, let's continue on. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, verses 34 through 37, and I want us to see how Mary responds. Mary asked the angel, How can this be, since I have not had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is her sixth, and this is the sixth month for her who is what's called childless, for nothing will be impossible with God. Now I want you to think back or go back up in the chapter and read about Zachariah's encounter with the angel. You see, the, count, the encounters were very similar in their message and very similar in the way things played out. There's also a difference. You see, they were similar in the sense that uh, both uh, the, the messages said a child will be born. 
Zechariah, a child will be born. Mary, a child will be born. But there were differences. In Zechariah's case, a child would be born naturally to an older woman. And in Mary's case, it would be a supernatural process with a young woman. And so we see these similarities and we see these differences. We also see that they both had questions. Zechariah had questions and Mary had questions. But in this process, Zechariah was questioning God's ability. Mary was questioning God's process. Zechariah said, how can you do this? Mary says, how will you do this? What's the process you're going to go about doing this? You see, Gabriel responds graciously to Mary's question. He reminds her of God's power, the power of the Most High. And he goes on to give her an example. He says, just consider your relative Elizabeth. Uh, she's going to have a child. So, so remember, I, I'm powerful, Mary. I can, I can take care of this. I can do this. Let's look at Mary's amazing response in this last verse that we're going to look at. Verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. Mary says, I trust the Lord. I trust him. He is the Lord of the universe, and he is my Lord as well. Just do with me as needs to be done. And, and the commentary I mentioned earlier, really, he ties Mary to a long line of those people who said yes to the Lord. Look, look at these folks here. Look at these examples. Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Esther said, if I perish, I perish. Ruth said, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Job said, even if he kills me, I will hope in him. Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. They all had a place to play in God's plan. They all had their role to play and they all said, yes. You see, you have an opportunity. Think about the person who shared the gospel with you. He had the opportunity to say yes or no to God. She had the opportunity to say, yes, I'll teach Sunday school to the little kids or no, I won't. You have an opportunity to say yes or no to God's plan. What's God asking you to do? Is God asking you to follow him for the very first time? You have the opportunity to say yes or no. Is God asking you to step out in faith and share your gospel with somebody? You see, God uses people to accomplish his plan. You may say, I'm not good enough to share the gospel. I don't know when to share the gospel, or my past doesn't let me share the gospel. God says, I choose the things that the world doesn't want to choose to share the gospel, to explain my kingdom, to build my kingdom, to grow my kingdom. God wants to use us, and you have an opportunity to say yes, to be part of God's plan. I hope you learned that from Mary this week, that you can do that. You can be a part of God's plan. Uh, let's look back and let's look at what we learned this week. God places people in positions to be used by him. Jesus is the promised Messiah who will reign eternal. God's power is seen in his redemptive plan. And believers are to humbly submit to God's purposes. Now let me challenge us this week. How is God using your past and position to open doors for you to be involved in his redemptive plan? How has God demonstrated his power in your life? Who do you need, know that needs to hear and be encouraged by you sharing how God demonstrated his power to you? Thank you again for joining me this week. I, I really do hope that you are learning from Mary, that you are learning that you can be a part of God's plan. I encourage you to join me next week as we continue on in the Christmas story as we continue to march through the book of Luke.